My name is Alan Levine, Executive Director of Hasbara Fellowships. Thank you all for joining us here today. I want to thank you for taking the time to be with us for Israel Engage, to be part of this virtual summit, for taking the time to learn with us and with college students from around the US and Canada. It makes a big impact, it makes a big difference to have you here. Wow, it's important to note that just some five years ago, you were not even allowed to say this word Israel in Dubai or in the UAE. You couldn't even mention it. Now, the Emiratis have introduced Holocaust education into their curriculum. Their leaders and official representatives have embraced peace and have embraced Israel in an unprecedented way. The Abraham Accords have shown us that peace is indeed possible. We just have to plant the seeds and change the narrative. Make no mistake, any group that opposes the Abraham Accords is anti-peace, even if they have peace in their name. And now it is my honor to introduce the Deputy Mayor of Yerushalayim, Flor Hassan Nahum, for our session, The View from Jerusalem. Flor is a balanced and extraordinary speaker in support of Israel and the Jewish people. She will join us in conversation with one of our brilliant Hasbara Canada fellows, Taylor Levy, a student at York University in Toronto. The floor is yours, Taylor. Okay, perfect. Thank you so much, Daniel. I'm Taylor Levy. I'm a Hasbro Fellow at York University, and I am so excited to be moderating this chat with Fleur Hassan Nahum today. She is the Deputy Mayor of, of Jerusalem and is in charge of Foreign Relations, International Economic Development, and Tourism. She is the co-founder of the UAE Israel Business Council, and she is of Moroccan descent and grew up in a British territory on the southern coast of Europe. She's also a law graduate from King's College London and has spent majority of her legal career campaigning for Jewish and Israeli rights. Fleur, it is an honor to be sitting here speaking with you today. So thank you so much on behalf of Hasbro Canada and Hasbro Fellowships. Thank um, you, Taylor. It's great to be here. Of course. Um, we have a lot of ground to cover and a lot of burning questions. Um, on the, what's been on my mind recently, and I think a lot of other students, is Amnesty International, which is a human rights organization, which came out with a 280-page report claiming that Israel is committing apartheid against Palestinians. Are you able to speak to why this is not true and the harms that this claim actually may cause to Israelis and Palestinians alike? So first of all, it's um, it's great to be here. And it's always, I always love addressing students because you guys really are our ambassadors, not just of Israel, but of the Jewish people. And I really admire you going out there and making the case for Israel. And I, I wish you didn't have to, but the fact that you are there in the front lines makes me feel better in Israel. So first of all, thank you for that. So let's go straight to it. Amnesty International. Well, Amnesty International is a is inherently a biased organization that cherry picks which conflicts they decide to, um, to investigate and, and tries to forget about facts and law and just pin labels on in order to malign. Now, it's, what's very interesting, before we get into their accusations of, um, of apartheid is that yesterday I actually read a very comprehensive article um, which uh, accuses them of um, built-in racism within the organization. Um, there have been a few people of color who have come out, uh, who were employed by Amnesty International, and they've come out saying that there's inherent bias in the organization, um, that, it's, that the senior management is, is, is mainly white Europeans, and that, um, and that there's constant name calling and intimidation of ethnic minorities within the organization. So it's very interesting that this organization that is inherently biased um, has also decided to take uh, anti-Semitism and anti-Israel sentiments to another level. Now, let me explain to you why their accusations are false and dangerous. Apartheid is a very specific label that was put on South Africa for a very specific uh, discriminate a government policy of discrimination according to color, race. 
um, and the whole of the um, the whole of the existence of the Afrikaans regime was about apartheid. Okay, now Israel is a country that was created um, in a reality where um, to give Jews self determination. Uh, it was a country that was born with several uh, birth certificates that most countries are not born with. So we have uh, UN resolutions, we have the Balfour Declaration, we have the Remo Declaration. I don't think any other country has as many birth certificates and permits to exist as Israel has. And Israel was never a country that was based on any type of a racial apartheid, quite the contrary, from our very early days and our constitution, we protect the rights of minorities in our countries. We do not separate between Jews and Arabs in any right in our country as citizens. Arabs are in every part of society, in the government, ministers, judges, doctors. In fact, the judge, one of the judges that put one of our prime ministers, Ehud Olmert, in jail, is an Arab judge. So the uh, accusation that Israel is an apartheid state is, is libelous, dangerous, and completely false. Now, what the amnesty report does is it doesn't make any differentiation between the different types of status uh, of the different Arabs living in this region. So the Arab Israelis are full citizens in every way. I'm not saying that our society is perfect and there's no racism. There's racism everywhere, just like there's racism in America, and there's racism in Europe. I'm not going to say that, every, that, that there's no racism. Of course, there's discrimination and racism amongst many. There's also discrimination and racism amongst Ethiopians. It's unacceptable. Not amongst Ethiopians to be discriminatory, not amongst the Arabs. It's, just, it's completely unacceptable. But the law of Israel protects minorities. Then you have the Palestinians, who are not Israeli citizens, and they live under the um, they live under the responsibility of the Palestinian Authority. So they completely ignore the fact that Israel went through a peace process that gave birth to the Palestinian Authority, which was supposed to be the framework that um, that slowly brings in a Palestinian state into being. And how was it going to bring a Palestinian state into being? By starting to take responsibility for their own people and taking care of their own citizens. And those citizens, they have to take care of them for health. They have to take care of them uh, for, for employment, for social benefits. That's what the Palestinian Authority um, um, agreed and, and to do under the Oslo Accords. Now, are they saying that we are an apartheid state because those Palestinians don't have rights in our countries? What do they want? Self-determination or not? You can't on the one hand say, oh, we want self-determination. We want to create our own institutions so that we can bring in our own state. And on the other hand, say this is apartheid because they don't have rights in Israel. Well, what is it? You can't have your cake and eat it. If you don't want your own state, then say so now. You can't say you want your own state and expect Israel to take responsibility for those people. So that is a fallacy. And of course, the Arabs in East Jerusalem are a third type of status of Arabs, which are Arabs who are residents and not citizens. Now, they all have the right to become citizens of the state of Israel. And 10 to 15% have already exercised that right. And let me tell you what, more and more Arabs from Jerusalem want to exercise that right. And there's so much demand to become citizens that we've had to open a second office for immigration in East Jerusalem to deal with the demand. Why is it that the Arab residents of East Jerusalem want to become Israeli? Ask yourselves, is it because Israeli is a racist and apartheid state? No, it's because the Palestinian Authority are a bankrupt, a mafia-led um, government that only line their own pockets, that haven't had an election for 20 years, and they don't really care about their people. Because if they did, they would provide them with opportunity and they would build institutions of state like Israel did way before we were created as a state in 1948. So Amnesty International ignores all of these things and they just say, oh, 
you Jews, you're here, so you must be apartheid. Not, and I think, in fact, it's an insult to the South African people and its cultural appropriation of a very specific time and a very specific suffering of the South African people in order to libel the state of Israel and the Jewish people. And underlying all of this is anti-Semitism, because anti-Semitism is a mutating virus. And 500 years ago, people hated Jews because of their religion. We were Christ killers, and we, we, we didn't accept Christ, and so we were slaughtered because we were not the right religion. 150 years ago, we were sent to the gas chambers because we weren't the right race. We were not of superior race. We were not Aryan. We were somehow a, a, a contaminated race. And today, that mutating virus called anti-Semitism is now proving itself to be against the national home for the Jewish people. And that's how it portrays itself. But make no mistake about it. Anti-Zionism means to be anti the rights of self-determination of the Jewish people, and that means the right of Jews to live in peace and harmony in our own country, and that is anti-Semitism. And so the Amnesty International report, in the end, it's a pile of anti-Semitic garbage with blood libels and with, in fact, on uh, page 25, as my friend Arsene Ostrovsky pointed out, a, uh, a, a libel of dismantling the state of Israel as a Jewish state. That was a very informative answer that I'm very appreciative of because it's such a long report that it's, I think, also distracting of what's actually in the report itself. I'm sorry my answer was long, but I hope it was clear. No, it was, it was perfectly clear. Um, it also, you know, it's very contradicting because they acknowledge, as you said, that there are Palestinian citizens of Israel, but then they blame Israel for committing apartheid because they aren't extending citizenship to Palestinians. And it, it, it just, it feels Look, very what, loose, loose. Absolutely. One example was the vaccines. Okay. That was another libel. So with the COVID a year ago, the Palestinian Authority under the Oslo Accords have responsibility for health. OK, they have responsibility for health and um, for their own people. So we were accused for not providing vaccines, which we don't have to because they have their own government. Um, and on the other hand, when we when we extended our hand in friendship to give them vaccines, they said, no, no, we're not taking them. What is it? Do you want responsibility? Do you want to build a state or do you want to spend the rest of eternity pointing fingers at the Jewish people? What do you want? I don't think they know what they want. It was an Amnesty International certainly don't know what they want. No. And I mean, because of that, do you think there's any solution to this on either the Israeli or the Palestinian side? Is there a way that we can? The only way yeah. is new leadership on the Palestinian side. I look, I have a lot of friends, um, uh, Palestinian leaders who are not corrupt and who love their people um, and whose aim is not to pillage um, and, and plunder their own people. But his aim is to, you know, bring about civil society, bring about self-governance responsibility. And I think that the that many nonprofit organizations around the world who they believe maybe um, they have good intentions, but what they do is essentially infantilize the Palestinian people not to take responsibility for themselves. Um, and so I believe that's actually very um condescending and, and racist, ultimately, um, to, to infantilize the Palestinian people and say, oh, no, no, you can't take care of yourselves, so let's just blame the Jews. Um, I think that's actual racism. And so we should hold them responsible. Uh, if you want responsibility, if you want to govern, if you want your own state, well, start governing, you know, and stop and stop robbing and pillaging from, uh, from the world uh, from the different countries around the world that are giving you money in order to build the infrastructure for a state. You know, they send the money for hospitals and they build tunnels. What is this? And, and at what point is the world going to hold the Palestinians accountable for their own um, misdoings and for their own illegal activities and for their own abandonment of their own people? Right. And I mean, another aspect that's also been in the news and that 
is very controversial to talk about is Sheikh Jarrah. And, mm-hmm. you know, it's been all over social media, especially this past May. You couldn't scroll through Instagram without seeing something about it. Um, and more recently, two homes there were demolished. Can you help clear up the air about this neighborhood? What was the reason for these evictions? And why are people trying to portray it as ethnic cleansing, but why are they wrong to call it such? Um, So basically, I want to make a separation between what happened last May and what happened a few weeks ago, because it's two very different situations. Unfortunately, they're both in the same neighborhood. So people just conflagrate them together and they say, oh, Sheikh Jarrah, they don't even know what they're talking about. So Sheikh Jarrah is a lovely neighborhood um, in East Jerusalem, very near the old city um, that has got some very lovely houses. Um, and, and, uh, let me just start from the beginning. East Jerusalem, as, as you know, um, was originally part of the, of the, of, of the, you know, before 1948, uh, the whole of Jerusalem was supposed to be under Israeli rule in the partition. Uh, there's, you know, there's different, uh, interpretations of it, but ultimately when all the different Arab countries around us in 1948 attacked us when we became a state, instead of accepting the two-state solution then that the UN had offered, they didn't accept it. They wanted the annihilation of Israel. They didn't accept any type of Israel. We, Israel, said yes to the partition plan, one Palestinian state, one Israeli state. And the Palestinians said no. And all their neighbors said no. So they launched a war against us. Now, in that war, unfortunately, uh, we lost uh, half of Jerusalem. We lost East Jerusalem. And the Jordanians were uh, illegally occupying East Jerusalem between 1948 and 1967. Now, when that illegal occupation happened, um, at the time, that neighborhood was called Shimon Tzadik. It was a Jewish neighborhood and an Arab neighborhood, and many Jewish families owned property there. They bought the property from the Ottomans, which was before the British mandate. Um, And so last May, what happened was, and this was very much an excuse for the war, not what caused the war. You know, when you want a war, you find excuses. You don't, uh, you don't start a war because of this or because of that. You're looking for an excuse, and there's always an excuse when you're looking for trouble. So basically, last May, what happened was there's a few families that, um, that for 40 years um, have been fighting in, in the courts um, the rightful Jewish owners of the properties in which they squatted for for for, for seventy years. So, uh, nineteen forty eight, there because of war, they came to East Jerusalem, and they um, and they were told by the Jordanian government, move in. It doesn't matter. Um, and in nineteen sixty seven, when the city was reunified, um, they were still there. Nobody kicked them out, and then. This Jewish Sephardi Trust, um, who owns the properties in the 1970s, started trying to reclaim those properties. And since the 70s and 80s, this has been in court. And for 40, 50 years, they these families have known that they can't prove ownership of these houses. But because we are a society of law and order and mainly humanity, the courts gave these families a very elegant and very kind solution. They said, look, nobody's going to kick you out of your house because what you essentially are in law are sitting tenants. Sitting tenants are tenants that have been there for different reasons for many, many years. And you can't just kick out sitting tenants. They have rights. And so the Israeli court said, you pay a very symbolic sum a year, a couple of hundred dollars a year, and you can stay in in this house and for the rest of your life. And at some point they accepted, which was a very, very, I think, kind compromise. And then, of course, the politicians get involved, the Palestinian leadership want to cause trouble, and they go and they brainwash these families and they say, don't accept the compromise, keep fighting, when they know that they're going to lose because they can't prove ownership. They know that all along. But the court is giving them a way to stay. And so um, last May, they used this as an excuse uh, to start this war. But these families were not thrown out then. And they haven't still been thrown out. 
They went back to court in October, November, December. They accepted it, then they denied it. You have to remember that this, this Al Cord and his sister have become Instagram celebrities on the back of this eviction that still hasn't happened. You know, they're crying wolf to the entire world and they're still living there. <laughs> so I don't know why they're crying wolf. Eventually, if they don't accept the compromise, they will get kicked out. And that is because they don't recognize our sovereignty or authority, and that's really bad for them. Um, that was the situation last May. In a few weeks ago, it was a completely different situation, but again, unfortunately, happened in the same neighborhood. And so people think it's all the same thing, and people don't bother to find out the facts. They just malign you. And when people are so quick to malign the only democracy in the Middle East, the only place in the Middle East where Arabs can actually vote, when people are quick to do that, you've got to suspect them of being a little bit anti-Semitic. Because otherwise, why not focus on the half a million dead Syrians or the million eagles in concentration camps or the tragedies going on in Africa? Why, why focus on, on five people in, in, in East Jerusalem? And the reason why there's such an Israel obsession is because it's the oldest hatred of all time. It's going back to this mutating virus. But anyway, getting back to the, the situation a few weeks ago, this is a completely different story because these people don't even have sitting tenant rights. They moved in in the 90s to an empty plot of land. They're like, hey, this looks good. We're just going to set up camp here. They, uh, they built a house and a business on land which wasn't theirs. How do we know it wasn't theirs? It belonged to another Arab family. This Arab family, so it's the al sahirs were living there, and the al Dayas who owned the land, and the al Dayas started kicking out the al -Sahirs. Um, And I'm assuming if they would have succeeded, uh, we wouldn't have had all this bad publicity. But what happened was, in the meantime, the city zoned this area for the building of a school for special needs kids, Arab kids. Um, because we, this area falls into brown zone. Brown zone is the zone of the city that is built for public use buildings, like community centers and like schools and kindergartens. And so the city in 2017 appropriated this land in order to build a school. Now, they are compensating the true owners of this land, the Aldeas, for the land that we've taken for a school. So they're getting compensation. This family just moved in in the 90s. And so they were basically squatting illegally. Now, imagine if I went in the middle of, um, you know, a park in London and built a house. And the city of London, of course, as is their right, would kick me out of the house that I built in the middle of a public space. Now, do you think uh, global ambassadors would show up and say this is an international, uh, you know, human rights violation? Of course not. This is the hypocrisy and the ignorance and quite frankly, I think embarrassing on their part not to even scratch the surface and find out that this is a family that was squatting. They knew from 2017 they had to leave. We begged them to agree with us a mutual date where we could help them move out, or we could put them in touch with social services in the city, or we could help them re-establish re themselves in a different home. But no, of course, everything in Jerusalem, from a brick in the wrong place, gets politicized and gets villainized and gets uh, slandered. And that's the situation in which we're living in. But what happened three weeks ago was a simple building and planning violation and squatters, illegal squatters being removed from land that was never theirs. And the family that actually owned that land, which is a Palestinian family, are being compensated by the city of Jerusalem for us to be able to build a special needs school for Arab children. Uh, well, thank you for clearing that up because so you said there's so much and it obviously it has to happen in the same neighborhood and then people are using different narratives on the same neighborhood despite not being the same problem. Um, and you were also touching on how Jerusalem is, you know, it's home to so many different religious and ethnic groups, not just Jews and Palestinians, but there's so many other groups of people that love that land. It's so precious to so many different peoples. I was wondering what the future of Jerusalem looks like to you. Well, look, two, 2,500 years ago, King David decided to build um, the capital of the Jewish, the Jewish kingdom in Jerusalem. Now, King David was originally from Judea, from Hebron, 
So most people would have said, well, why didn't he make Hebron the capital of the Jewish people? And the reason why he picked Jerusalem was because Jerusalem didn't belong to any one tribe. Jerusalem was that space between Judah and Benjamin, and it was neutral ground. And he built his capital there because he wanted all tribes to feel at home. And so I believe this very much in the DNA of Jerusalem to be a city of diverse groups, to be a city of different tribes. And we actually love that. We love this convergence of, um, of different nationalities and religions, um, backgrounds. You know, we love the, the juxtapositions that exist in Jerusalem, you know, East and West meeting, heaven and earth meeting. Um, there's so much which is about merging things in Jerusalem. And so I see a future which is very much like our past, continuing to be a city of inclusion, a city where we believe diversity leads to better innovation, a city where everybody feels at home. Um, and that is our plan in the way that we're planning the city, in the way that we're building the city, in the way that we're distributing resources more equally than ever, and in the way that we're developing the city economically as well. Wonderful. Um, you know, despite the diversity, a lot of people, especially in North America, are trying to portray Israel as not diverse and that Jews don't belong there. Um, and for Jewish students, especially on college campuses, it often feels like we're very much alone. Um, how can we continue to educate others about Israel and especially about, you know, boycott, divest, and sanctions movements um, here on campuses in the diaspora of the true diversity of, of Israel and especially Jerusalem? So that's a good question. I think that you guys um, are in a tough spot because when you go to college, you are being given a choice to either be pro-human rights or be pro-Israel. And what they do is very clever. They portray being pro-Israel as being somehow against human rights and nothing could be further from the truth. First of all, if we wouldn't be here, um, there would be no freedom of worship for anybody uh, that isn't the sovereign power. Here we are the sovereign power and we create um, opportunities for freedom of worship and we actively, actively endorse freedom of worship. Now that wouldn't exist anywhere else. All anybody has to do is come to the Jerusalem walk around and, and, and wonder, you know, what is this apartheid or racism or occupation that they're talking about? You know, I have given birth four times and I've always shared a room with an Arab lady from East Jerusalem giving birth at the same time. Um, my park, my neighborhood is uh, full of families that are both Jewish and Arab. My Zumba class has got uh, ultra-Orthodox women, Arab women. Um, we very much live uh, a life uh, together. Now, we don't live in similar neighborhoods, but I think that's more of a religious thing. It's not a, it's not any, for any other reason. People like to live in their own communities. That's fine. I, you know, I, I don't want to live in an ultra-Orthodox community, and ultra-Orthodox people don't want to live in my community uh, for different reasons, for cultural reasons, for religious reasons. Um, but ultimately... Jerusalem is a city of diversity, and whoever says it isn't is because they haven't been here. And so I think that what you have to ask people is, well, have you been there? Um, and, and, and if they say no, then you have to kind of question them, well, how are they so sure? Uh, and what type of propaganda are they listening to? And why are they so close-minded to only hear one side of the argument? Um, and so I think the challenge is to get people to dig, you know, below the surface a little bit. And one thing you do, I think it's pretty clear what slander and anti-Semitism is um, and what the bias is and, and, and what they completely ignore. And this is the double standards is, is what goes on in, in the Palestinian Authority, uh, you know, from brainwashing of children, from, uh, from uh, throwing uh, people from the LGBTQ plus community from rooftops. Uh, from from um, making uh, making them feel that they're outlaws, uh, people from the LGBTQ community, women and the lack of rights, 12-year-old girls being married off to 32-year-old guys. I mean, everybody ignores this. They ignore it. They have this blind spot to any human rights violations going on here only as it pertains 
to the Jews, then they're worried about human rights. If they really cared about people here, then they would be pointing their fingers at Hamas um, that are doing these horrible, horrible practices of institutionalized pedophilia with these girls and, um, and, and brainwashing children into hatred, uh, militarizing two-year-olds, um, you know, building tunnels to destroy and not building people hospitals that they need um, and not building people infrastructure and jobs and 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 what they're doing and being a state being accepting Iran's um, Iran state sponsoring of terrorism. So, you know, Hamas is a proxy of Iran, Hezbollah is a proxy of Iran, and these are our neighbors. And so they, they have a blind spot in all the obvious places. And they're so, so quick to judge and they're so quick to condemn. And what they don't realize that that attitude of being quick to condemn Jews comes from a very deep place of anti-Semitism. And the Jewish students that fall into this I believe are either self-hating Jews, they don't know enough, or they really think that by allying ourselves with the enemy of the Jewish people, they're gonna be cooler or more accepted. And in the end, what they will realize is that they will be hated too. And one day, maybe not now, but when they're in their thirties, they're 35, when they're 40, and their so-called friends turn themselves against them, they will realize that they were led up the wrong path for all those years, thinking they were fighting for human rights, but what they were doing is fighting against their own people. Right. And, you know, despite all of that fighting, there is some work starting to be done now that, you know, is much more peaceful and it's, you know, bridging these gaps between Jews and Arabs in the entirety of the Middle East. And hopefully soon it crosses over everywhere and there will be peace throughout the Middle East, but you know the Abraham Accords, unfortunately, have been dubbed a dangerous weapon by anti-Zionist Jewish groups, and they're in reality, you know, a really important step towards peace. I was wondering, you know, what kind anybody of who, by definition, is against peace needs their head examined. Yes, <laughs> I don't know what they think they do. I, I really don't know how anybody could be against peace. How can you be against peace? No, it's. Why? It's ridiculous. The Emirate, look, I am very involved in the Abraham Accords. I have created two organizations, one before the Abraham Accords and one after the Abraham Accords. Before the Abraham Accords, I co-founded the UAE Israel Business Council. Today it has 5,000 business people from the, from the Emirates and Israel. And we created the first online platform for businesses to do business together, uh, which was, of course, during the COVID, which is when the Accords were signed. I also, after the Accords were signed, I created the Gulf Israel Women's Forum. I co-founded it with uh, my friend Justine Zwelling. And that's women leaders from the Middle East. I've got women from Saudi, women from Egypt, women from countries that are not even at peace with us, who are like, we can create a better society. This is fantastic. This is what the new Middle East can look like. And so whoever's against this is sick in the head or just downright, um, I, I mean, how can you be against peace? I want them to explain to me, how can they be against peace? Yeah, it's very mind-boggling how people can be against peace and it just i think shows how deep this hatred runs the beauty is taylor that we just get on with it we don't care what they say the bds campaign has had zero effect on the israeli economy whoever goes against us ends up shooting themselves in the foot um, look what happened with Ben and Jerry's and Unilever. They've lost a lot of value on their stock and it's going to keep plummeting because you can't say, oh, you can't sell ice cream in East Jerusalem, um, uh, in the old city, in the Arab quarter, but in the Jewish quarter. Oh, in the Jewish quarter, you can't. And, 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 and two meters away from it, you can. What is that? It's ridiculous. It just shows ignorance and hatred and, and just bad feelings. Um, and so what you can feel happy about is that the BDS have only shot themselves in the foot. They've had zero effect. Israel last year had the biggest investment year in ever, 8% growth in 2021. Um, they, they're not 
they're not scratching us even. And so, um, you know, they can continue thumping in the mouth and we're going to continue building bridges and we're going to continue making peace. And there's nobody happier than the Abraham Accords than the Arab that I know in East Jerusalem, the Palestinians and the Arab Israelis. They are thrilled because, you know, every single flight I've been on, and I've been on quite a few flights to Dubai, um, half my flight is full of uh, of Palestinians or Israeli Arabs, and they're thrilled. And so the European colonialists can keep thumping at the mouth and we're going to keep making our peace with our indigenous cousins here in the region. Yes, and it's it's incredible. I think, you know, Peace is difficult to attain, but when it does, it's so wonderful to see and to know that Jews can go to different places in the Middle East and a lot of uh, and also, families have been. And also it's changed the paradigm, you know. What's happened is, and this is why these people are, are so angry, there's no longer an Arab-Israeli conflict. It's gone. What exists now is the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. What exists now is an Iran threatening the entire region and the world. There's no Arab-Israeli conflict anymore. And that really annoys people that want the annihilation of Israel. Because, you know, be sure to understand that the people who don't want peace don't want Israel to exist in this region either. Right. Well, I have one final question for you, and it's um, a bit more personal and, and happier, I would think, because you are not just a Jewish and Zionist icon but also a feminist icon that I looked up to. And I know so many other women and Jews and Israelis and everyone looks up to. Has being a woman in Israeli politics been challenging? And do you think your experience would have been different if you were in a different country? Um, Well, first of all, thank you for the lovely compliment. I'm not quite sure how much of an icon I am, but uh, but if if I am to your and your generation something or some type of a role model, then I'm happy. Um, Look, I don't know. I wasn't a politician in another country and I'm not a man in this country. But what I can tell you is that being a woman in politics is hard for one main reason, because you're always, whatever you are, whatever you do, you always are underestimated. Women are underestimated in general. Women are especially underestimated in politics. In other words, at the beginning, nobody takes you seriously. It's like, winking, okay, girl, you can try, you know, that type of thing. Um, But I like to see uh, every silver lining on a a cloud. And I think we have to use um, the disadvantage as an advantage. And the main advantage um, to being underestimated is that they don't see you coming. So you have the power of surprise. I love nothing, love nothing more in the world than proving people wrong. I love nothing more in the world than uh, leaving a trail of people who underestimated me because I'm a woman and showing them that we can do things in a different way. I think a better way in many, many cases, especially peace building and bridge building. This is a particular strength of women. Um, Women have um, a way of creating very strong bonds very quickly because we speak um, in a more, we speak our own language in a way. We speak to other women in a more emotional level, in a more open, we share more, we talk more. Um, and, And that's why I created the Gulf Israel Women's Forum because I believe that if we want a sustainable, long-lasting, warm peace in the Middle East, which is the peace that we need, that's only gonna happen through women. And that's why I created the Gulf Israel Women's Forum and it's proven to be incredible. And the fact that I have Saudi women in the forum when we don't even have peace with Saudi Arabia just shows you that women are ahead of the game in terms of bridge building, in terms of putting our pride and egos aside. We do that better than anybody. We do that better than men. And so I'm very proud to be one of those people who are pushing forward peace building and bridge building initiative as a woman, because I'm a woman with other women. It's truly incredible to watch. Um, you know, you're not just breaking barriers in, in Israeli politics, but also for women worldwide and especially in the Middle East. And to watch that is incredibly inspiring as a young woman. Thank um, you, dear. So thank you so much, Fleur. This has been truly an honor. We have a few questions from some students. Um, I think, Sharon, if you'd like to unmute yourself. 
go first. Yes. Hello, hello. Um, first of all, Fleur, thank you so, so much for speaking today. Really, really inspiring. Um, for me, as someone who supports Israel as well as other women, uh, I appreciate it. Um, my name is Sharon, and I'm a student volunteer with Hasbara Fellowships Canada. And I'm also a recent graduate from uh, the University of Toronto. And my question is that uh, most student clubs, you know, that claim to be pro-Palestinian, they spend all their time demonizing Israel and very little time actually supporting Palestinians. And, you know, they support BDS, even though it harms Palestinians and Israeli Arabs. What's the best way to educate other students about this reality? So that's a good question. And it's it's a difficult thing because they come in with such kind of hatred and, you know, the, the aim is to delegitimize. So what I try and do is I try and challenge them and start with something like this. I believe in the Palestinian people's right to self-determination. Do you believe in the Jewish right to self-determination? Now, if they say no, then you say, well, that makes you an anti-Semite and the conversation is over. If they say yes, then you have an opening to try and discuss what Palestinian self-determination should look like and why the Palestinian leadership should be taking responsibility for their own people. And if they should be, um, you know, pushing or advocating with anybody for equal rights, it's for Palestinian authority uh, to treat its own people better and to provide the resources that they deserve and certainly to actually trickle down all the help that they're getting from the whole world. So that's one way of approaching it. And the other way is thinking, you know, tell us, what, what does a what does a state for you look like? Because, you know, after all these years and the Palestinians still don't have an idea of what they want their state to look like. Is it a religious state? Is it an Islamic state? Is it a secular state? What type of um, government institutions are you going to have in your state? Where does civil society play a role? They have no clue because their entire identity of the so-called pro-Palestinian camp around the world is not pro-Palestinian, is anti-Israeli. So what you can challenge them and say, how are you exercising your pro-Palestinian stance to advance the Palestinian people? Let's say Israel didn't exist and you wanted to create a Palestinian state. What would it look like? They have no idea because that's really not their focus at all. Thank you so much. Thank you, Sharon. Um, Emma, if you'd like to unmute yourself and turn on your camera. Yeah, hi, Sharon. Thank you so much. That was a very powerful conversation. And I'm definitely like super inspired by everything you've said. Um, my name's Emma, and I'm a Hasbro Fellow at Queen's University. Um, and I had a question. We briefly spoke about this, but last May during the Israel and Hamas conflict, there was so much misinformation. Um, being shared about um, Sheikh Shara and even though individuals like yourself are working hard to offer the truth, um, why do you think there's still so much misinformation being spread and why are social media influencers and the media so ready to accept all these falsehoods and lies about Israel? I think it's, it's, um, it's a combination of ignorance and anti-Semitism. Um, you know, the influencers who jump onto these campaigns, they just... They don't know anything. They don't know anything. They just, it's a trendy hashtag. You know, why isn't anybody trending, you know, free Ukraine at the moment? When, when, when Russia is about to launch a, a world war in the footsteps of a, of a, of a sovereign country. Uh, why? Why does that not happen? The reason is because it's not trendy because hating Jews has been trendy for hundreds of years. And the reason why hating Jews has been trendy for hundreds of years is, I think, two reasons. One is because people believe that when you punch up, um, it's not really discrimination. Um, and I think that people look around and see that Jews are successful. Of course, the reason Jews are successful is because we've worked very hard to be successful, because we're ambitious people, because we contribute, because we work like dogs to be accepted and to do better than everybody else. Uh, no, nobody gave us anything. So we built it ourselves. And so people look at that and there's a certain element of, well, well we can't be anti-Semitic. Look how well they're doing. So that's that. And the second thing is um, that I believe that a lot of the people, especially Europeans, who kind of feel slightly guilty or 
very guilty for the Holocaust and how in, in, in a civilized continent like Europe, they could have killed six million Jews indiscriminately. They kind of, this kind of washes their conscience a little bit. Oh, well, the Jews are just as bad as the Nazis. Of course, that's ridiculous. We don't kill anybody that doesn't try and kill us first. Um, and so um, I think it's a combination of anti-Semitism, ignorance, and let's just wash our guilty conscience of the fact that the only genocide that's happened in the civilized world was, was done against the Jews. Thank you. Thank you, Emma. Um, next, Gabrielle, if you'd like to unmute yourself and turn on your camera. Hi, Blair. Thank you so much for that. It was really informative. Um, my name is Gabrielle Weiss. I am Hasbro Fellowship Social Media Manager, and I'm an alumni of Pace University in New York City. And my question for you today is, there are groups such as Jewish Voice for Peace that are against the Abraham Accords and peace between Israel and other Arab nations, unfortunately. Is it worth students' efforts to try to educate them about why are they wrong for having this approach? I think um, that you don't have to educate them why they're wrong. Just share the great stories and you'll just prove them wrong. You don't have to explain to them why they're wrong. Just prove them wrong. And so every time you see a nice story about um, a wonderful project that's been done between Israel and the UAE, Israel and Bahrain, people to people, you know, what makes this piece different and wonderful is that it's very much people to people led rather than, you know, leadership led, which was the case with Jordan and, and Egypt. Um, but even with Jordan and Egypt, they've got like FOMO now and they've like doubled and tripled, they've doubled and tripled their trade with us in the last, since the Abraham Accords, it's incredible. And so I think, look, let me tell you a wonderful story. I, you know, I, I do a lot of work in East Jerusalem with the Arabs of East Jerusalem to try and bring them opportunities and, and try and equal the playing field in terms of startup nation stuff and bring big high tech companies. You know, I, I, I work for all the all my constituents, Jews and Arabs alike. Anyway, so one day I'm in this meeting and I come out of this meeting and this Palestinian guy comes up to me, Mahmoud, and he says to me, Flo, I have to tell you a story. I said, what? He said, well, I was in one of your webinars that you did for the UAE Israel Business Council and I met a, an Emirati and I met a Moroccan and an Israeli and we've now opened a company together called the Jerusalem Saffron Company, which is, you know, making saffron, which is like a very rare and expensive spice um, in Jerusalem with Emirati money and Israeli technology and Moroccan seeds. And that happened from your uh, from your webinar. And so this is amazing. These are the stories that I love to share. In East Jerusalem, for example, um, we have a we have two amazing organizations. One is called Tech to Peace, and one is called Fifty Fifty. Both organizations aim to bring Palestinians and Israelis together to create startups together, and many of those startups are social startups to help people. And so, what I would do is instead of you know putting yourself on the def defense, just share the stories and go on offense. Don't bother. They're honestly windbags shouting at walls because they have zero effect on the peace building and bridge building that we're doing. You're going to waste your time and energy. So just share the joy. That'll make them even more angry. Thank you so much. Amazing. And we have one last question from Max. So Max, if you would like to unmute yourself and turn on your camera. Hey, for. Thank you so much for taking the time to talk with us today. Hi, Max. Uh, my name is Max, and I'm a graduate from Binghamton University. Um, so something that we see a lot on college campuses and online is that uh, there's a lot of negativity in this narrative surrounding Jerusalem about sort of like who it belongs to, quote unquote. Um, obviously, we know Jerusalem is like an incredible, diverse melting pot with Jews and Jews and uh, you know, Muslims and Christians wanted to know if we could hear from you um, a positive experiences working and serving as a uh, deputy mayor in Jerusalem um, from more of a local perspective. So look, I, the stories are so, uh, there's so many stories and, um, and Jerusalem, look, for, we have to also look ourselves in the mirror for many years. Um, 
Israel didn't really know what, what they were going to do with East Jerusalem. During the Oslo Accords, you know, that the kind of the, the conventional wisdom was that half of it, uh, the Arab part would be a Palestinian capital, it would be split. But I think after the failure of the Oslo Accords, failure which is only attributed to the Palestinian leadership, because Israel was ready to make peace and they were the ones who rejected it again and again and again, um, is that there's been kind of in East Jerusalem a, a change in, in the attitude of the Arab residents. And they've realized that the city has actually got their arms wide open in order to be able to build and help uh, with economic development, etc. And so we have incredible stories of bridge building. We have organizations that we created to help small and medium-sized business, to give women, you know, I think with, if we've learned something from the uh, underdeveloped countries or developing countries is that um, when you give a woman a loan, she comes back with, an, with, with, a, with a business that supports her family. And so we've taken those models and we're empowering Arab women in East Jerusalem with many of our programs. Um, there's more and more Arabs in high tech in the city than ever before. There's more Arab young men and women uh, in our colleges and universities than ever before. There's more Hebrew being taught in East Jerusalem than ever before because the Palestinian Authority schools there are very, very uh, adamant not to teach Hebrew, to keep people ignorant and poor with less opportunities. And so I think it's a combination of Israel outstretching its hand in the last six years with real resources to try and create infrastructural development, to try and create economic development and educational development. Uh, it's a combination of that and the Arab population East Jerusalem saying, hang on, you know, we have health, we have education, we have everything coming from the city of Jerusalem and the government of Israel. You know, I think we're gonna we're gonna take this because the other side are not going to be our salvation here. They're not going to offer us anything, and so this gives me incredible hope. Um, and like I say, my daily my daily work um, sees me uh, in East Jerusalem um, talking to Arab uh, partners, the Palestinian partners, um, Arab Israelis, Druze um, people. That, we're friends. We're, we're building the city together, and so because I know that that's a reality. It's easy for me to tune out the negative voices uh, that are telling us uh, what they think that we're doing, but it's not actually what we are doing. Um, and so you just have to look at the, at the stories that are coming out of Jerusalem. Uh, our mayor, Moshe Leon, you know, there's never been a mayor more dedicated to closing gaps, social gaps in East Jerusalem than him. Uh, the leaders, the Arab leaders of the different neighborhoods meet with him every month. Uh, whatever they ask for, he's willing and he's able. And they say they've never had such a good mayor. So I think it's it, it's us um, coming forward, opening our arms, and it's them coming in and saying, "Yeah, we we want to we want to do this together." And so that gives me a lot of hope, um, and that should give all of you a lot of hope. And I think that this is why the radicals get angry when they see normalization, where where it be in uh, on a regional level with the Abraham Accords on a national level with an Arab party finally uh, being in the government of the, of the state of Israel or on a local level, all the bridges being built between East and West Jerusalem, the radicals don't like that. The haters don't like that. The haters can keep hating and we're gonna keep building. Thank you so much. Amazing, that was the perfect uplifting note to end off with. Um, so I just wanna thank everyone who's in attendance for coming and listening to the incredible floor. Thank you so much again, Floor, for speaking with us today. It has truly been an honor to sit here and, and talk with you about Israel and life and Judaism and hopefully peace in the Middle East. And I just want to extend, you know, my gratitude once again for all of the work that you're doing because it's so truly important and inspiring. And I really hope one day soon we can see peace between all Israelis and Palestinians in Israel and in the diaspora. Um, and with the helps of you, I really do think that that is a possibility. So thank you so much for being here. Thank you, Taylor. And thank you to Hasbro Fellowships. And I really hope that you all get to come to visit me in Jerusalem very, very soon. I will be on the first flight. <laughs> Wonderful. I'm going to pass it back to the executive director of Hasbro, uh, um, Daniel. Um, thank you again, Daniel, for this opportunity. That was truly brilliant. Flor, I am floored every time I hear you speak. 
Taylor, you have a bright future ahead of you and our community should be so lucky to have you as an activist and as an advocate for the Jewish people. Thank you again to all of you for joining us today for Israel Engage Winter 2022. I will remind you, none of our work is possible without your support. Please consider making a donation at www.israelengage.org. Thank you and Shavua Tov. We would be pleased to send a complimentary DVD of this program to anyone who wishes to support JBS with a tax-deductible gift of $36, double chai, or more. Simply visit the JBS website at jbstv.org and click on the Donate button to make a donation by PayPal or your credit card. And please indicate the program for which you would like a DVD. Or you can send your tax-deductible check to JBS, Post Office Box 360, Stamford, Connecticut 06904. Or you can call the JBS Pledge Line at 833-MY-JBS-TV. That's 833-695-2788. And again, please remember to indicate which program you would like to receive with our compliments. We thank you for your kind support.